President Obama still has Trump on his mind. Tuesday, he spoke to the Economic Club of Chicago, where Crane's columnist Greg Huns noted a startling comparison of Trump to Hitler. <laughs> Huns paraphrases what he heard President Obama say. We have to tend to this garden of democracy or else things could fall apart quickly. That's what happened in Germany in the 1930s, which despite the democracy of the Weimar Republic and centuries of high-level cultural and scientific achievements, Adolf Hitler rose to dominate. 60 million people died, so you got to pay attention and vote. So, Nazi Germany, here we come. Now, he said this just hours before Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which makes Donald Trump a pretty weak Nazi. The worst one. Yeah, the worst one ever. <laughs> and after America had just decimated ISIS, the worst group of fascists since the Nazis. So we aren't becoming Nazis, we're stopping Nazis. But this is what liberals do, comparing adversaries to Hitler. But Obama's right. If you stop paying attention, anything could happen. You could elect an inexperienced senator from Illinois who relentlessly expands executive power with a phone and a pen, a radical progressive, just a stone's throw from Stalinism, which <laughs> killed over 100 million people. See how easy this stupid little game is? So as Obama indulges lazy tropes, he ignores the crushing of ISIS, a free press that's now louder than ever, and a federal government whose reach and size may be shrinking for once. It's a bittersweet symphony that's So some controversy today from Pope Francis that has people sort of turning uh, their heads a little bit on this one. The leader of the Catholic Church suggesting that the Lord's Prayer, the best known prayer in Christianity, which is prayed by not thousands, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. but 2.2 billion people around the world, may undergo a little bit of an edit. He says the phrase, lead us not into temptation, suggests that God induces temptation in his followers and do not let us fall into temptation would be more acceptable and closer to the original meaning of the prayer. So who better to sort this out for us than our good friend, Father Jonathan Morris, Fox News religion correspondent. Thanks, good to Martha. see you, Father Thank Jonathan. You. Um, so I still have a hard time with consubstantial, so I'm a little bit, uh, <laughs> I'm a a little bit reluctant word. to change. Um, hey. What, what's the meaning What he's here? saying is not, I want to change the words of Jesus. Nobody can change the words of Jesus. Jesus existed. Jesus was a historical figure. He said the words of the Our Father, not in English, but in Aramaic. And the best translation we have of the Our Father is the Greek. And then that Greek was translated into so many different languages. And those translations are very different. In English, it says, lead us not into temptation. But guess what? Jesus didn't speak English. And it's really kind of bad theology, as well as even in the Italian. But, for example, in the Spanish, it says, no nos dejes caer. In other words, don't let us fall into temptation, if that makes sense. He's saying that the translation isn't very good because God never makes us fall or never leads us into temptation. He actually allows us to be tempted, but we have to make a choice. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, he's, the Pope is obviously from Argentina, so yeah. you know, in his experience, it didn't sound the way it sounds now that he you know, is, is dealing with the English language more. I mean, I guess my question is, why did it take so long? If this is wrong, if it yeah. doesn't line up with theology, why did it take... Well, think of it. We, we pray this all the time. 2.2 billion Christians pray this all the time, and we don't think that God is the one forcing us into temptation. We understand that he allows us to be tempted, but I think all evangelicals, Catholics, uh, mainline Protestant uh, Christians would say, God does not lead us into temptation. It's a bad translation, honestly. Go back to the Greek. Uh, go, we don't know exactly what he said in Aramaic in this case, but go back to the Greek, and it's much closer to a lot of translations that is, don't let us Well, what fall about the argument that everything temptation. comes from God, right? So, well, so evil and whatever come from comes God. into your life in different ways was you know, sort of put there for you to learn a well, lesson, God, put there for you God to... never does evil. God never does evil. So God doesn't create evil. Evil is the absence of good, actually. Okay, so God creates everything that's good. And he never leads us into temptation. Like, you now be tempted. No, 
he allows us to um, experience life. And so he when also, is this change happening? When do I have to start changing? You know what? It's, it's already changed in <laughs> so many languages. So in other words, our experience is like, oh my gosh, that's such a big deal. But in so many languages, it's much closer to... I think to, it's easier than consubstantial. It, I think I can make this change more easily. Well, very few Father people John know consubstantial, but you do, you, Martha. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you so much. <laughs>